All right, so today we're going to be debating there's no such thing as white privilege in America. My position is there is no such thing as white privilege for the affirmative. In my opening, pass the mic really quick to Siegfried so we can get some back and forth going. First, the reason I object to there's no such thing as white privilege is the word white has no real definition. Well, think about it like this. If you define white as European, 85% of Americans, whether they be black, Latino, Asian, etc., have at least some European DNA within them. So is everybody white? And at what shade does a person that's white or partially white get rid of their white privilege? The question is, there is no answer. The sh what shade of melanin your skin becomes to be, would somehow turn you from race A to race B is something I object to. Second, white privilege infers that there's our entire, there are entire set castes, or at least classes, within society based on the skin pigmentation. The reality is that privilege has everything to do with socioeconomic background and less to do with melanin. I think the best, and the best summary I can give you is that poor people from poor neighborhoods are going to be worse off than rich people from rich neighborhoods, regardless of skin pigmentation. That's my opening. I'm going to pass to Siegfried for the counter. Sure. All right. So here's my opening case. Uh, white privilege exists. When you understand what it really means, I think you will agree. Many people don't know what white privilege really is. They see it as a, in the context of a discussion of systemic racism and judge it to mean pretty much the same thing. But it's not really the same. So what is white privilege? Professor Peggy McIntosh defined the modern understanding of white privilege in 1988 with her article entitled White Privilege and Male Privilege, a personal account of coming to see correspondence through work in women's studies. Her paper made the rounds in academia, then into the social justice movements, and from there into popular culture. And kind of like a game of telephone, uh, many people have gotten confused by the message in that process. Peggy McIntosh sums up her definition like this. I have come to see white privilege as an invisible package of unearned assets that I can count on cashing in each day. The whole point of her article was to make us aware of these assets, these privileges of being white in America. Some stem from racism, but many stem from just the simple fact that white is the norm of American life, the dominant cultural paradigm. Peggy lists 50 illustrative examples. I'll share a few of these uh, and uh, also some experiences from my own life. So I can turn on the TV. I can quickly find memories my own race who look like me represented in a positive light. I can speak plainly and no one will say, boy, your English is really good. I can travel nearly anywhere in America, won't feel like an outsider or an exception. I can be late to a meeting without having any that lateness reflect on my race. I can pick up a bandage and it will match the color of my skin like this one. I can criticize the police without being chalked up to self-interest. If I'm passed over for a promotion or pulled over by the police, uh, I never need to ask whether it's due to my race. The fact that these are small, subtle, all pervasive is why Peggy McIntosh wrote her article, to help us be aware of the reality of what it means to be the dominant racial norm. That's white privilege in America, and it absolutely does exist. Now, a lot of people think of it as having something to do with who's rich and who's poor or who's done well or who hasn't, but it's not like that. It doesn't determine the outcomes in your life. It's just the day, day basis that I have certain advantages that other people don't. Um, let me give you an example of uh, something that happens to my wife all the time. So uh, she gets into a conversation with somebody, usually white people, and they say, hey, where are you from? And she says, Chicago. And, a and she says, Chicago. And then they hem and haw until she finally tells them that her parents are from the Philippines because that's what they really want to know. Once a man followed up this exchange and he said, wow, that president of yours is some piece of work, huh? To which she replied, Trump? Yeah, I think he's an idiot. I don't have to have these kinds of awkward conversations because no one questions where I came from, whether I'm an American or not, what my nationality is, or where I was born because I'm a white guy. I have white privilege in America. Okay, so this guy goes to the key point. Uh, white privilege white privilege infers that there's an objective definition of who is white and who is there's a way to clearly indicate who is white and who is not. Do we have an objective definition of who is white and who is not? Before we move on, let me pass them um, to Siegfried so we can so make sure that we're operating on common grounds here. Uh, we don't have an objective definition. We don't really need one because white privilege is about people's personal experiences and individual experiences in life. So, so long as people see me as white, 
that's white privilege. Now, maybe I have a little bit of uh, African DNA, kind of doubt it, but it's possible. Um, that doesn't preclude me from being white. Um, my wife looks like she might, you know, she's Filipino, but some people think that she, maybe she's Hispanic. She's been mistaken for Native American, all kinds of other things, but nobody's mistaken her for being a white person. So it really is about a subjective judgment of whoever is there. So does that automatically mean everyone with light skin will always experience white privilege? No, but they will whenever people think they're a white person. So um, that's about as much as a definition as we need. So my objection is that we, if we're going to be operating uh, on whether something exists or not, we have to be working on some sort of objective, uh, some a sort of a objective way to be able to define the words that we're using. If 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 we define white as uh, seventy five percent or more of Western European heritage, right? that would at least conclude a certain segment of the population. However, with it throughout time, you can see that people have discriminated through all parts of Europe. With going, if you go to the, uh, to the late 1800s, people from Southern Italy, people consider people from Italy to be white. If you, when you went, to, when my ancestors came from Ellis Island, off a box called other than white because they were from southern italy now because i've been apparently mistaken at one point in time for being other than white i i have a problem with people saying you're white because i don't believe that so if we can't operate on a certain a certain discipline to say who's white and who's not i think that the white privilege again has to do with more about being uh i guess you could say i want to say um uh basically uh, second generation third generation privilege somebody that i that somebody that's actually adapted to the culture somebody that's actually able to f speak fluently without an accent people make fun of accents from all over the uh, from all over the country whether they be from the south whether they be from the northeast whether they be from the northwest there's all distinct accents through the united states however the people that are always questioned about whether somebody comes in is probably because they are speaking with an accent other than the people that they're generally around that has nothing to do with the skin my, the my skin melanin or the skin melanin it has all everything to do with the people like with an in-group and an out group that generally the people that are in the in-group are the people that have been there for more than one generation thus i don't see how white comes into the the, the uh, equation whatsoever well i mean in our society in our lives we don't make exact and we don't have a little melanin mess that we we pull out and we analyze people with uh, people just make snap judgments they make judgments based on their subjective perception and we're not talking about anything else today we're not talking about some government system that classifies you and classifies me or says I have a 98.7 percent uh, you know uh, prestige score or privilege score I have a super high privilege score your privilege score is only 50 my wife's is 45 and that guy over there on the street corner he's a three and it's not like that um, white privilege is really just about uh, creating an understanding for people in their everyday lives so they can see what's going on to them every day that they may not normally encounter or experience, like the fact that when I go to get a Band-Aid, right, like this guy, it pretty well matches my skin tone. That's kind of nice because you don't want to draw a lot of attention to your Band-Aid. Now, you can go out of your way to get clear Band-Aids or bandages with other skin tones and things, but because I'm a white guy, I don't have to. I can go to any first aid box in the country. I'm going to get a white skin tone bandage and slap it on my skin. Yay for me. Nobody's going to ask me weird questions about my, uh, you know, my ethnicity or what language I speak or any of that stuff because I can just go through life. I'm, uh, I'm a happy white guy. I mostly, most people don't really realize these things because they don't know that there's another type of life out there that people can experience. But and this stuff is all around us every day and it, it is happening whether or not how you want to define who's a white guy or not. So another story of mine I'll tell. I was vacationing in Anguilla with my wife. This is in the Caribbean islands. So we were eating by the shore side, having some nice fish. And we we're talking to a young man that was there, a local guy. And, uh, you know, he was asking what I did for a living. I told him I was a software engineer. And he was like, oh, hey, you got to open a shop here. And I go, well, you can make a ton of money. I'm like, yeah, well, why is that? He's like, well, look, um, you know, there are no white guys that have computer shops here right now. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to buy computers from a local guy because he's going to cheat you. Right. Uh, and, he, and they don't know anything about computers. Right. But you're from you're, uh, you know, as a white guy, they're going to believe that, you know, all about computers and that you're going to give them a, an actual deal. You're not going to cheat anybody. You're going to give a fair price. So if you had a shop here, like everybody, all the local guys would come in here and shop at your store. Did I earn that advantage? No, no. 
people have there. And maybe they're right. Maybe the local guys are going to cheat them, and I wouldn't. Uh, but that's not something I earned. That's just a, an attitude that everybody around has. So if I start a computer store, I get this, uh, you know, competitive leg up for nothing I ever did. But I just have white skin. I think I'm a white guy. I know about computers, and I won't cheat them. Um, and that's that's a good example of white privilege. And I never would have known that exists if that guy hadn't come up to me and told me about those attitudes. So uh, that kind of stuff is just all around us every day. And that's all white privilege really is. Okay. Well, what you did was to find another situation where there was in-group preference over out-group preference. I can give you an example that me and my, uh, me and my girlfriend are from Hawaii. We are a, if white people are a severe minority in Hawaii, there are a rape, a racial epithets called, I'll use it so people can understand context, called Howley, right? If you're, uh, if you actually grow up in Hawaii. Um, now being, being for that's still within America. However, um, it's all dependent on who the in-group and the out-group is. And I don't think anything, it has, has anything to do with being white. Now, just the only thing that in-group preference has motion over to make, to make a new term called white privilege infers that white has some sort of universal preference across the board, no matter where you go or where you travel. And that's just not true. Way we can see that the people that are, uh, situation some preconceived notions about who your abilities are based on their in-group preference and their out-group preference and whether that be from the west coast or versus the east coast is going to be an in-group preference or an out-group preference based on what sports teams you like it's 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 all subjective but there's no there's no universal theory where white privilege can be able to move forward that's i mean the the topic here is there's no such thing as privilege in America. And I think they chose that specifically. Uh, there's other countries where there's privilege, absolutely. And there's other countries where there's not white privilege. It's not white privilege necessarily in Japan and maybe not in Hawaii, although that is part of America. Um, I know, yeah, Howley, uh, I have family that is uh, from Hawaii. My uh, my uh, great, great uncle Buzzy Trent's famous surfer guy, and he's in a Hawaiian family. Um, so I'm familiar with that. And yeah, there's absolutely discrimination against white people in Hawaii, and there's discrimination by white people against Native people as well. It's a, it's a little bit more of a mixed community, and there's a little bit less white privilege if you live there. There's probably some Native privilege for living there as well. Doesn't matter. I, there's rich guy privilege. Uh, there's male privilege. It's all kinds of privilege. It's just basically saying privilege is, uh, you know, in this context, some kind of unearned benefit that you get just for being the color of skin you are or the sex you are. It doesn't have anything to do with virtue, uh, right? It's, it's not a personal earned advantage. It's just an unearned advantage that you happen to get. And in America, specifically you know, the lower continental 48 and probably in Alaska too, where I grew up, uh, there's white privilege. Uh, being a white guy has a lot of inherent advantages. Uh, you know, it's a cultural term. We all really understand what it is. There's uh, people of mixed heritage, of course, and usually they end up falling outside the white guy category. And again, it's not an objective measure. It's a subjective experience that many people have. So, um, you know, just because I, I have these stories, I'll share another one. Um, so I think they're all illustrative that this thing called white privilege exists in many different forms. So um, my wife, as I said, Filipino-American, her mother adores me. Um, in her eyes, I can do no wrong. Uh, this is partly because she idolizes Americans in general, especially white Americans. They saved her family from the Japanese uh, during World War II. And uh, Americans came in. They gave everybody in the islands money. Uh, they did a lot of great things, saved them from poverty. So she treats pretty much anything I say as like the gospel truth. She's a Catholic. I'm an atheist. She doesn't care. Anything I say, she's like, oh, oh very you know, nods her head. She agrees. Um, she berates her children. Uh, she yells at members of her family. Uh, her sister-in-law, who's Filipino, never speaks up to me ever. Um, we were having dinner together. Uh, she was speaking about a cousin of hers who married a black man recently. And she said, I warned her not to marry him. I, I told her those black men, they like to have sex with their children. You know, little boys. They're not Christians. I told her not to do it. It's true. I'm afraid for her babies. And, you know, I was shocked uh, at this racist statement. I, like, I told her as politely as I could, but firmly, look, that is wrong. It's not true. There's no evidence that black men rape their children. That's just completely wrong and racist. And because I'm a white guy, I'm an American guy, uh, she didn't put up any resistance. She just, oh, I'm so, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I don't know what I was talking about. That is white privilege. And that's a power I have as an authority figure in America with other people. And uh, it is what it is. I'm just trying to understand how this is different than in-group. 
So, um, from, so at, at this point in time, we we have a, we don't really have a clear definition of what how what white is and, and what privilege is. We have a definition of the experiences that you, that Siegfried has given us. Siegfried, you've absolutely given some good examples of in group preferences, uh, out group preference. You've given some good examples of people that are racist. You've given some people uh, you could, good examples of people that have unfair to, or unfairly prejudged your wife in certain circumstances. But none of those things are, are you. Well, white privilege, in, at least, infers in this context that there is a universal white privilege for that I uh, that I can go any part of the United States, or and be able to get some sort of benefit for the color of my skin, or assuming that my skin is white enough to be able to be qualified as white privilege. Um, I don't see any evidence for that. I see the evidence for a socioeconomic privilege based on the fact that if your family has more money and has more uh, has more money to put your child into a better school, you have a privilege of being able to go, be going above the rest of society. I don't see how melanin in the skin uh, as any qualifier in this context, in this debate, as having any sort of difference than in-group preference. Now, there's no justifying in-group preference, but I'm, I'm debating the fact that white privilege is just another way of explicitly give, uh, of giving a subjective examples of in-group preference. And subjective examples of in-group preference does not denominate because as Siegfried has admitted, those are subjective experiences. The only objective thing that we understand across the board is in-group preference, which can be applied in all circumstances and be able, be able to understand what's going on in all cases. I'd say in this debate, I, I think that we can't really, uh, if, we, if, we can't, if we're not going to talk about the context of what race is or what white is, we have to understand the, what privilege is in itself. And, and we're going to basically assume that privilege means some sort of advantages in society that objectively are going to help you across the board. And we don't see that for, for having melanin in your skin that are certain pigmentation than other people. There is definitely an objective measure, though, that people that have wealthier backgrounds have an obje uh, have a privilege that other people don't. If we, I think that would be more more appropriate for the term privilege in the first place. In either case, well, white privilege doesn't. I don't see any evidence for it existing across the board. Now, Siegfried, if you want to, if you want to take that straight on, uh, be feel from feel free or take it in a different direction. Um, well, let's let's attack this from a couple different angles. I'll, I'll address this a little better. Uh, in group preference, right? A preference is something that one some people like over another. Um, that could imply bigotry and racism. However, uh, privilege, white privilege, as as designed by Peggy McIntosh, it has things that that nobody prefers. So I can walk out onto the street, uh, walk anywhere in the country, and I will mostly see people that look like me: white guys, uh, white women white people, and I will feel uh, perfectly natural. Uh, my wife could go out uh, most of the parts of the country we travel in. She won't see lots of Asian people. She won't see people that look like her. She'll see people that look like me, white people everywhere. That's not a preference, but it is a privilege because people tend to feel most comfortable when they're in familiar situations around people that they are accustomed to. Uh, and so that is a privilege, not a preference. And you know you can say an in-group preference. Well, the in-group in America is generally white people, white men. And then you could go even further up. You could say rich white men born in privilege. Well, okay, great. Um, but white privilege in America is very real. Uh, you know, Peggy lists a whole bunch of things. I've given you a bunch of examples. These are things that we experience as white Americans that give us a leg up and that other people don't get to experience uh, because they're not white, so they don't get those privileges definition of the term. I mean, it comes from a person who popularized the term. That's how it was created. Um, it speaks to a specific phenomena that no other term describes exactly. Uh, it makes us aware of things that we often take for granted. It's easy to measure because it's about experience, not any kind of outcome of who wins or who loses. Uh, it doesn't cast any blame or guilt or encourage any kind of division. It encourages self-awareness, sympathy, and greater understanding of other people and their experiences. And um, it's kind of silly to have definitions for things uh, that don't exist, right? So um, to say there's no such thing as white privilege um, is to kind of define the term as being meaningless in and of itself. But we have a meaning for the term. Uh, Peggy McIntosh gave it to us. She gave in her book 50, or in her paper, 50 illustrations of what it means. Um, I've given three personal accounts of my experience of what it means to me. Uh, it's a very real phenomena that people experience every day. You're kind of definitionally trying to dance around the thing, but it is what it is. If you're white in America, there are things that you can take for granted every day, like the fact that my Band-Aid matches uh, or that other things that are called skin tone crayons will be my skin tone, not somebody else's. Um, 
these are just things that being white uh, has an advantage of. Now, if you were over in Japan, it'd be different. There'd be, uh, you know, a native Japanese preference, a native Japanese privilege. Um, and it would be a different kind of, it would be the same sort of experience, but it would have a different focal point. And in America, the focal point is white rich men at the top. But as you move down the ladder, yeah, white guys uh, have a level of privilege that is exclusive to being white skinned or Caucasian skinned or however you want to put it. Um, even you know, whatever your DNA is, that's what it ends up being. Uh, so again, my, I'm, I, I'm, my, challenge to the concept of white privilege is that there's no set definition for white privilege and if no one can define what white privilege is and if it, if, if it's able to mold with the ether based on someone's subjective experiences it's the equivalent of actually having no definition whatsoever if i was to put up a, a definition uh, and I, I would just say i called it um toxic privilege and then i was able to use all the examples that you use and then said well it's all because it's a toxic privilege right because all these examples are toxic towards one individual and not toxic during the rest just because someone inferred it and people and so people believe it and just say and most people believe it just say it's a majority that's still an ad populum fallacy if we can't explicitly define what white privilege is and if it's able to mold based on everyone's subjective experiences then there's no objective definition for white privilege and thus there is no way to, there's no reason to use it the reason the example that you given that said that that people actually didn't or that it, you said it wasn't in group preference based on the fact that uh, your wife went to a situation where there was people that look different from her and there's no people that look similar to her and yet so they have a, a certain hesitation to do certain a certain normal behavior towards her is, is is different. That is in group preference. That's the exact same thing. So I, I, my my point is that white preference, white privilege, and the examples that have been given in this debate seem to be just another way of describing in group preference. And if you if you want to create definitions of, for your words that you use in your situation, that's fine. But across the board, there's no objective measure of what white privilege is, who has it, when someone accompanies it, when it's being utilized, and how I can utilize it myself. And it, what which, which measure people can be able to walk into a certain scenario, be able to define the geographic presence where white privilege is going to be acceptable. You can give a, a, like, a general terms, but when we're working with explicit terminology, which has, de which has a definition, working with a definiendum called white privilege and the definiends, which includes the words that define white privilege, we haven't been able to come to an, agree an agreement that white privilege exists in any other way other than outside of the ether and somebody's subjective experiences that can mold based on the circumstances that they walk into and based on the fact that the melanin of the people that are in the in-group preference happen to have a whiter skin tone than the person in the out group. Now, that person being in the out group having a different skin melanin and in, from the people in the in, in the group does not make it white privilege. That makes it in group preference. And I think that I made my point. Well, I explained the difference between privilege and preference. Preference is an act and privilege can be an entirely passive circumstantial fact. So there's a, an, a meaningful distinction between those two words. So white privilege is different than in group preference. White privilege is also specific because it says the word white. Um, and white has meaning in America, and therefore it has social meaning. It's important uh, that I have white skin. That is what people cue on when they see me. I can walk into a restaurant. I could have a bag full. I could have $2 in my pocket. Another black guy can come in next to me. He could have a million dollars in his pocket. Salespeople see us both. You know what? They're going to gravitate over to the white guy. I did a debate on uh, waiters and tipping. Uh, fact is, uh, black people tip less than white people, and 30% of waiters admit that they serve white people better than black people because they know they get better tips. Um, now, that's an example of preference, but it's also acceptable the fact that the color of my skin is what's making the difference, right? Now, because we don't have a gradient, we can't measure it, that's not enough. People know what a white guy is most of the time. It's not too hard to figure it out. People know what a black person is most of the time. So in America, in socioeconomic terms, that's the way things go. Now you say it's a, you know, it's, it's a subjective term. Look, blue is a subjective term. Is that blue? Is it teal? Uh, doesn't really matter. I mean, unless you're talking about, uh, you know, a color code definition, we don't use it that way. Um, blue is blue. We kind of understand it, even though some variation. So there's variation on what exactly it means to be white or black or any other uh, type of uh, ethnicity in America. But well, socioeconomically, we all kind of understand what a white guy is. Uh, and so I think it's a perfectly understandable, perfectly reasonable term. Um, it was coined very specifically by somebody with these specific words to have a very specific meaning that she explained. Um, and so, uh, well, you know, I appreciate the uh, attempt to kind of parse it out, but to, to get rid of something that is useful for creating understanding between people, understanding between different ethnicities uh, in America and, and getting past our socio 
racial problems that we have in America, which I'd very much like to do. It's a very useful thing. It's a good term. It's a useful term. It's helpful. So uh, I think we should recognize that it exists um, and uh, be aware that, that these factors are out there. Okay, just as a uh, counterpoint to Siegfried, Siegfried brought up an interesting point saying blue is subjective. Actually, believe it or not, blue is a primary color. It's quite an, it has a quite objective definition. Being a primary color, there's actually a very objective measure of what's blue, what's not. Now, there's some people that have difficulty uh, seeing the differences between red and green when they're colorblind because the mixing might be might make it up to interpretation. However, blue is, a, is a, actually a prime example of having an objective definition, having an objective measure of what blue is, and having an objective measure of, how, of the percentage of blue by mixing certain colors together to actually get a certain shade of blue. Now, being white, this, this is by this is a complete difference uh, because, as I pointed out in the very beginning of this debate, 85% of people in America, whether they be black, Latino, white, uh, Asian, have at least some Western European DNA within their makeup. If that's the case, uh, if that's the case, then we have to understand that there there has to be some sort of gradient that cuts off at what percentage people have white privilege and what percentage some people don't. I haven't seen anything to be able to at least explicitly define that other than we can all know it when I see it. Well, when I know it when I see it isn't an objective definition. That's, again, someone's subjective personal measure, and that's the problem that I have with this debate. Well, I just ask anybody in the audience to ask if uh, any of the examples that I've given of what white privilege if they've experienced those things due to the color of their skin. Uh, and if they have, then white privilege exists and you should vote for con. Uh, I don't really want to get into color wheels. This is an important social topic on uh, how we get along and respect each other as human beings. And I'll leave it at that for the debate. Find out. Siegfried has pointed out that um, there is objective. There's definitely racism in people on in certain in certain classes in certain uh, denominations of certain backgrounds of certain demographics get discriminated against based on their skin. That has nothing to do with white privilege. That has to do with racism that are being explicitly used against groups of groups of people based on nothing but the color of their skin. I'm not denying that exists. I think that that if that exists, that's wrong in all circumstances. Let's be very clear here. I just don't believe that there's a uh, there's a universal measure of of uh, somebody that has white privilege and what that is. And I think going forward in this debate, I think I can. I don't need to use up my time. I think that I made my point pretty clear here. There's there's clear definitions between if we're going to use something and adopt it, and and we're going to debate whether something exists, we have to be operating on some sort of objective measure. So far, we've gotten great examples of the difference between uh, of in-group preference versus out-group preference, right? People and Siegfried made a good a, a good counter by pointing out that he said, "Well, there's a difference between privilege and preference," and then he proceeded to give me an example of preference, which may goes to my point that every single example that you can give me of white privilege in the subjective definition, where somebody that's white is able to interpret. Uh, some uh, attitudes from other people is nothing but it within their own head and the it heads of the people that they're in, in company with. That is called in-group preference in all circumstances. And I think what we've had a, a great conversation. I'd like to take this further in another time.